Hey everyone, how you guys doing? So we're about to start getting in here for our last panel. So this is, um, this is our risk management panel, really excited about this. Um, our moderator is Tim McNiff. Uh, Jamie Campbell, she's the player safety and concussion representative for USA Hockey Pacific District. She's also a seven year director for the California Amateur Hockey Association. Steve Lang is the national director for USA Hockey's Pacific District. Neil Mitchell is the uh, property and casualty insurance professional who has recently joined the players health team, but he was formerly a managing director and member of Marsh Canada's National Leadership Executive Committee. Kevin Margarucci is the manager, and players, uh, ma manager of player safety for USA Hockey, and Josh Opiola is the director of risk management of one of our partners, uh, Sport Engine. Thank you, Kyrie. Hang on. I'm checking my on. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you for coming back in and, and hanging around. Uh, this is one of those panels that, uh, it, this has taken me into deep water, but as I was doing the research on this and we were exchanging some emails back and forth, it's so timely, and, and this is something we're talking about, risk management. This panel is going to try to share best practices in risk management and the implementation of a, of a successful risk management program. Now, most sports organizations know that they want to have a formal risk management program, but they don't know where to start, and they need guidance. Most risk management programs can be complicated, and then there's implementation. Mm -hmm. So... Where do we begin in this discussion of, of trying to have this happen, Jamie? How do we, how do we, how do we start out with an organization? What, when, if you were to start one tomorrow or today, what's step one? Well, I think you need to identify what your biggest risk is uh, and start there. And then you know, try to determine how many of your members it affects, what's the impact of it, what's the volume, what's the urgency. So to give you an example, what we did in California seven years ago, uh, was we determined, and Steve, you can speak to some of this, but Steve was the California uh, affiliate president. And this is USA Hockey. USA Hockey. And we had some bad concussions that were really impacting our athletes. And so uh, Steve put together a panel of people that I was on to develop a concussion protocol. It was the first statewide affiliate protocol within USA Hockey. Um, and since that time, it's grown to the Pacific District, which is six states. But to develop that, first we had to really understand how many of our athletes were affected by concussions, um, who was reporting, who wasn't, how often were they reporting, why weren't they reporting, what was the fear? What was the underlying fear as to why athletes didn't report? Um, and then what kind of education was needed? Um, at the time that we developed the protocol, there was no state legislation. All of the states now that have state legislation for concussions came after we started this. So we truly were. Did they use your? process you think as a, No, as a, okay. I don't think so, not at the legislative level, but they okay. have within our sport, which is exciting. Um, so, you know, you have to figure out how to reach your membership, which a lot of the panels have talked about before. So we have a really multifaceted approach to that. We have uh, print media, we have social media, we have, um, you know, forms and documents and protocol and videos and um, all the different ways um, that we can provide outreach to our membership, but it takes a real commitment but I would say that when you're starting a risk management program, you need to identify the risk, the urgency, um, the volume, the impact, the membership, and then develop your communication around that. And so, did you want to add something, Steve? Sure. When we started it a while back, like she said, we had <coughs> seen uh, several of our players uh, sustain concussions, some, some of them minor in nature where they were able to recover quickly and get back to play. And then there's others that sustained uh, numerous concussions that ultimately affected uh, their life as they grow and can no longer play contact sports. So putting together this concussion committee, the whole idea was about education and training. And that's exactly what they did. And it's a little difficult to push risk management concussion training to coaches and players and parents that they just want to go play the sport. And now you're adding something to the play to try to help educate them to keep their players safe. So as we moved forward, uh, we created protocols. We did training. We trained, uh, oh gosh, 
uh, you know, recently over 3,000 people. And, but we do everything hands-on. And we, we go to the states, we go in front of the coaches and players and managers, and we talk about concussion protocols, training, awareness, things of that nature. Now, like you said, it's a district-wide. And we have to acknowledge that in every sport, there's some type of uh, danger to it. In the sport of hockey, we have to admit that it's, it's a dangerous sport. But at the same time, we do things to prevent it from being dangerous. And those are called rules or penalties that we put in place. We've talked about it from the checking from behind and the tripping and the charging and the boarding, things of that nature. And then we've recently put something together that was just to be for our district, that it was an acknowledgement form to all of our members that recognize that the sport is dangerous and you could be injured and you could sustain a concussion. And they were going to initial it and it was gonna be part of our membership uh, uh, registration. And USA Hockey ultimately took that product and made it a nationwide product. It's not a whole lot, but it just says that you recognize that the dangers of the sport and you recognize that this could happen by initialing it, and you do that as part of your registration. Well, we were talking about earlier in the sports administrators uh, panel, the, the role of insurance, and, and uh, that's where you come in, Neil. I mean, and, and you could have an administration or, or a youth organization that says, well, this would be a good idea to have, and we should get on this maybe tomorrow. You can walk in there and say, no, you'll do it last week. I mean, so how big a role does insurance play in this whole thing? We're coming from the insurer's perspective. Sure. Uh, thanks, Tim. Um, I, I think the conversation around insurance is almost um, a byproduct of really the reality of day-to-day -day living, day-to-day -day sports, or playing in the field, the gym, or on the ice. And um, insurance shouldn't be the boogeyman, um, but I think in the conversation around a solution, as the other panel panels talked about their uh, focus of expertise and experience and knowledge. I think it's, it, the insurance piece is more of a partner on that as opposed to thou shall not do this or I don't want to insure this or that. Um, I, I kind of approach risk maybe a little bit in an unorthodox style, but someone taught me a long time ago that um, it's not about insurance, it's about risk. And in order to manage risk, A, you need data, and you need that data not only to make the appropriate decisions as opposed to anecdotal, uh, non-empirical things, you, you also need it to transfer and price the transfer appropriately because you don't want to price something too much and not give enough coverage sure. when, in fact, it should be cheaper and broader in coverage because the data is educating us. It's not this fiction, it's this reality. So I, I, I kind of look at the old triangle and call it a wisdom triangle. And you've got data on the bottom, data drives information. And it's from that information, we develop knowledge about risk and appropriate retentions and or transfer insurance and the pricing of that. And ultimately at the top of it is wisdom. And all that comes in, and I, I, I think the sport of hockey, I, I grew up in Canada, so when Sidney Crosby got hit, we thought the world had ended, right? And um, so... Unless you're in Philadelphia. Uh, true, <laughs> true. Yes, yes. That's, Sorry. Why did I bring up that analogy? <laughs> <laughs> Thank God I'm in Minneapolis. I couldn't resist. Yeah, yeah. They don't like him. There's a few Canadians here. Uh, we keep it quiet, but we're here. Um, so, yeah, I, and I think that's it. Like, it, it's a triangle, and you got to start with data. And I, and I think more than ever, technology can pl play a vital role in dealing with what Steve's talked about in terms of let's not make this get in the way of having fun and coaching. If we can use technology to enable the collection of data so we can start building some pretty good information, from which we can make some really sound knowledge decisions. And insurers love data. I'm not an insurer, I'm a, an right, advisor right. practitioner. So I'm the guy in the middle. 
they love data. And if you can bring data that is rich and real and current, then you solve a lot of problems. We got people on the moon, we got this place open today because it's insurable. So as uninsurable as some people may think certain events are, like concussion, abuse, et cetera, those things can be insured. And they can be insured at a competitive price, at broad cover, but you can't get there unless you got the data. And so I think what I hear people talking about today is the relevance of information and data to start getting at the tough issues and solving the tough risk issues. And it's, it's not always all about insurance. Right. If you can mitigate the risk, that means you're containing more risk and there's not, you're still s transferring severity and that's what people are concerned about. They're concerned about what you read in the paper, the abuse allegations, the terrible concussion events as Steve said or the doctor before with US hockey. Some of these guys and girls, this is the way they're going to live their life. But we should have a vehicle to help them live that life that they're left with to live. And that comes through insurance. Well, let's talk about, and, and, and Kevin, I don't mean to paint you in a corner. If, if this can be a toss up, if you want to go with this, please. But we've heard data, insurance asking for data, doctors are asking for data. I mean, okay, but at your level, how do you go about collecting the data? And who are you depending on for that collection? And is it reliable? Well, that's kind of the million dollar question. Um, and like Doc Stewart mentioned uh, in the previous panel, um, we don't have a national injury registry database uh, for youth sports. And I think that's a huge, huge thing that, and it's a big mountain to climb to get to it. And, but again, the qu million dollar question again at the end of that is who's putting that data in? Is the debt, you can build a great injury reporting system, but at the end of the day in our world, and I know a lot of other youth sports are in this, it's parent volunteers, it's coaches or team managers. And how much knowledge do they, all right, they may know someone got injured and Johnny went down on the ice and hurt his shoulder. Okay, so now we, if that got reported, all we know is there was a shoulder injury in Pee Wee hockey. What was that injury? Um, how much time did they miss? What, and all that kind of stuff. And unless there's a physician diagnosis and then that has to go back to those people to input that in order to get the actual injuries that are going on. And so is some data better than none? Maybe, but if it's bad data, is it any good at all? And that's the question that we have to um, you know, try to answer. Right. Josh, did you wanna to add to this? Uh, no, just acknowledge it. That's okay, that's okay. That's exactly right. So, so um, we're talking about uh, injury reporting. What about transparency? And accountability, and is somebody you know? If if I say this, this person may be held <coughs> out, or if I report this, this may cost us in this way. How do you? And this is a toss up for anybody. Uh, you've been there. How do you how do you tackle that? How do you address that issue, Steve? Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Were you somewhere else? <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about the whole thing of, of transparency and accountability, and wh whoever's right. you know, and the fear, I guess, maybe fear might play an issue in in the reporting of injuries. And it, and it does. And one, the player, if he sustains an injury, doesn't want to say anything because why? He doesn't want to be taken out of the game. He wants to continue to play. Um, another player probably won't recognize another player having an injury and probably doesn't feel it's his job to say something to anybody. The coach, uh, if he knows you well enough, he could recognize if something were to have happened or you sustained some type of severe injury and do something about it. But at the same time, the coach wants you to, if you can, you can stand, you can walk, you can talk, you can play. The parent also, you know, they want you to play. They want you to be on that first line. They want you to be the starter, and they want you to get all the ice time you possibly can and score the goals. And sometimes they, they turn an eye to a possible injury, or they'll ask later on about it and say, you're okay, you feel okay, and then you're back to being on, on, the, on the line again, and you're continuing to play. So the education and training of our coaches to recognize concussion, quick, simple symptoms. 
teaching the player that it's okay to say something if you're not feeling right. And your teammates to recognize a fellow teammate if there's a possible injury, to report that. Jamie, can you talk about uh, culture of risk versus culture of safety? Yes, I can. Would you please? <laughs> <laughs> I've been dealing with this for about seven years now. And um, in full disclosure, I'm a volunteer uh, for USA Hockey and have been for this is my 11th season. So um, my day job is hospital administration. So um, developing risk uh, management programs is something that I see a lot of on a daily basis. But it's a culture shift. I know we talked a lot um, about that, and we have in previous panels, but the, the culture of risk can feel very limiting and prohibitive. And a culture of safety can feel very inclusive and collaborative. So what we have tried to do with all of our player safety-focused Pacific District programs that we're currently working on, concussion included, is develop um, the culture that goes along with it. So your previous question to Steve was about accountability. And no one wants to take responsibility or accountability for reporting injuries. I mean, no one wants the responsibility. Who should? The player should. The parent should. The coach should. We all should. Everybody's got a hand in it. Right. <clears throat> but who wants to? Nobody. <clears throat> so you have to change the culture. You have to make that shift to where everyone involved, where the coach says, no, absolutely, there's nothing more important right now than these people. These people are more important than the game. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, last year, um, we implemented a program, a little pilot, um, of elevator speeches. For those of you that are familiar with elevator speeches, trained all of the coaches in Northern California to give a one-minute elevator speech before the start of the season to their teams, every age, might all the way up, every level of play. And they were supposed to take one minute and just simply say, I need you to understand what a concussion is, these are some of the symptoms. I want you to tell me if you think you've had a concussion because nothing is more important than you, your safety, and your brain. I want you to tell me. I had so many coaches, even those who had played a really high level of hockey um, in their careers, say to me, I have never had a coach tell me that they want me to tell them if, I, if I'm injured. And we saw such a shift just in Northern California with the way coaches um, started interacting with their, with their athletes and their players. They were thanking us by the end of this little exercise. They were cussing at us before we started it. But by the time we were done, they actually all reported, when I followed up, they all reported that just telling them that they need to say it, you need to say this. Your players don't know. Oh, my players know. We're huggers. You know, we're, we're good. We're all good. We have a great relationship. No, you need to say it. Just say it and watch what happens. And it was amazing. So I think that's just one of the little steps that we take to try to make that culture shift. And, and Neil, can insurance comes in, we, in a conversation, you can also help enforce that culture shift or yeah. help it happen. Yeah. I mean, I, I really like the way you differentiated risk and safety. And I think the insurance industry falls into this trap of insurance and risk. And really, it's about safety. And if you have a safety culture, you're likely going to have, you're, you're going to have incidences, you, you know, kids are going to get cut and scraped and banged up. Um, but it, it, it's a different tone, it's a different context. And I think you get more and more people to embrace the delivery of information, which is what you're asking your coaches to provide. And that becomes part of your data set, right? And insurers, and some are very, strange in their view on, actually insurers are the most risk averse. You think that they're assuming risk, but they're very uncomfortable with assuming with risk, right? So I think not, no one has to be concerned that the insurer is the boogeyman because they read the paper, they probably have kids too. So, but what I think brings insurance more into a social good is in the context of safety. Because insurance all started about, I mean, they were peers. They were like homo, homo, uh, like kinded risks. So envision a bunch of hockey players insuring themselves, right? So it is about safety. And I think that's, that's a very interesting 
comment from Jamie, and it's a good takeaway for those of us in the insurance space is we need to be embracing and let's use words that promote inclusion as opposed to, oh my gosh, it's our insurance renewal. I think it's a good takeaway for all of us. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Okay, if you're worried that I, I didn't know that Josh was sitting down there, I, I do. I do. I've been saving this because as we were having this uh, discussion and we were looking at these issues, there are things that you know are out there. Concussions have been in the news and you know you're going to have to deal with these things. And then there are issues that come up and you don't see them coming, but maybe you should. <coughs> and we had a story here locally uh, within the past month about a, a skating coach in, in Eden Prairie who had an inappropriate relationship with one of his students. And then, of course, what we has taken the national headlines for the last couple of weeks is what's happened with USA Gymnastics and, uh, and Larry Nasser. And uh, Josh Apiola is the director of uh, risk uh, management for a Sports Engine. Mm -hmm. And and you have a background in abuse. And, and, and so this whole yeah. thing coming up with, with Dr. Nasser, and you, you, from an outsider's perspective, you watch this, or from a news person's perspective, I watch this, and I'm like, how could this happen? At so many levels, there were so many failures. From an organizational standpoint, how couldn't they see this coming? Or did they see it, and did they just ignore it or shove it under the covers because of the, a different vision. So from your perspective, you see something like this and your thought is? Oh my God, how do we continue to do the same thing over and over again? Um, is we see this, and by the way, this is the most awesome Minnesota panel ever because this is all hockey people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, it's, even, we even have a Canuck here, so he's not a, on the board, but I'm a board president as well here in Minnesota, so this is the greatest hockey panel ever. And <laughs> this is pure representative of Minnesota, plain and simple. Um, but back to it is that the same things continue to happen over and over again. And it amazes me because in this, if, in this day and age where nothing is private, and anyone who thinks anything is private, it's not, by the way. Um, nothing is private. Snapchat's not private. Nothing is private that organizations at the size of USA Gymnastics, Penn State, USA Swimming, um, have continued to have these problems that um, they think they can hide and continue to hide year after year after year. And the, the attitude of you know, continued failure and lack of responsibility at anyone's level, it is perplexing to me um, that we can continue to have this. And what I have seen is it goes back to the very first panel that we had with, you know, the parents and having everyone go into, you know, sports specific. You know, everyone is doing just, my, my daughter's guilty of it. She's 13 years old. She only plays hockey. I've tried, and she's like, I only want to play hockey. I'm not going to tell her she can't play hockey. Um, but I have told her if she ever tells me she doesn't want to go, she doesn't have to go. Um, but we have to continue to push these kids, and there's this social aspect of it that comes with mom and dad. One of the things that I try to teach um, my organizations that I work closely with is we are doing a tremendous job educating our coaches. We are. USA Hockey is, has been the leader for years on educating coaches on safe sport and all these different things. But we need to start turning the tide here and educating mom and dad. Is We need to educate mom and dad when you're signing your son or daughter up for these individualized trainings and classes is you need to take a training to understand what some of these warning signs are. And the warning signs um, are ridiculously obvious. Once you know what they are, they're blatant. And I walk around, unfortunately, noticing these, these signs. Um, and they're not from the stranger danger that we were always brought up with. Um, it is the close acquaintances. Tim, you and I were talking about it. It's like you, you'd have your nephew watch your daughters when they were younger, but he would be even more concerned about um, no, I never, never, no, no, no males were allowed to watch my daughters unsupervised ever, never, <laughs> just my thing, that's what we did. And, pardon me, my point back was, it's, you're better off, your odds are better having uh, somebody that you got off of a website or referral to have somebody watch your kids than a family member, because the cases of abuse are not stranger abuses, they are friends, family, and acquaintances. Um, that means hockey coaches, football coaches, all of this. Those are the people who are, have direct access to your kids and basically unlimited access to your kids. So educating the mom and dad about what the particulars are and laying ground rules specifically for the coaches, um, is it, that's where the success is going to come. And this ability for the, the boys and the girls 
um, to come out and say that something's wrong, is we need to encourage that wholeheartedly and don't let this stop. You know, if there's anything you guys can walk away with from, from my portion of this panel, is don't let this stop where it's a bad thing to say anything. It's always okay to say something is wrong or something has happened. At no point is it not okay to, or to push somebody away that they, it's not a right to talk about. It's okay to talk about. We just need more men to come out and say it's happened to them. Thank you, Theo Fleury, for helping with that. Yeah. And Steve, you come at this from, a, you have your experience in hockey, but you also have 40 years in law enforcement and dealing with the same sort of thing. Did you, is there anything you wanted to add to this? Well, when it comes to the uh, gymnastics, um, you know, that's the newest one, but you keep in mind that we had a major one back in 2010 with the U.S. swimming. And the whole incident boiled down to the way complaints were handled, and they weren't. So major lawsuits came out of that and a lot of allegations of uh, sexual abuse. And uh, they, were, they were all sustained for the most part. So then the USOC you know, created a blueprint for player safety and the policies to protect our athletes. And at the time, the USOC announced to all of their national governing bodies that you will create a policy, a, a safe sport type of policy, to protect all our athletes and everybody in our membership from any type of abuse, sexual assaults, or whatever. And the nice thing about it is that accountability really starts at the top. And so, as administrators, you have to recognize that you are accountable for it, and you need to protect your athletes at all costs. And protect your board of directors and how you do that by educating them and training them and making sure that they're going out there and preaching that word also that it's okay to say something and to make sure that everybody is, is aware of that you know there was over 300 complaints of uh, sexual abuse in gymnastics and um, over a 20-year period and 80 gymnasts came forward with uh, similar allegations against one person and it's like a allude to you. How can that possibly be happening today? And that's a fear uh, for administrators too, as a parent, to have that happen to your child or somebody that you know. And unfortunately, or fortunately for me, I refer to all of our players as my kids, my players. And that's the way I look at it. And so the education and training, not only with its concussions, but it's the abuse and the safe sport to make sure that everybody's on the same page and that administrators are and will be held accountable for all of that. And hence, you know, safe sport for all national governing bodies. And Tim, really quick, mm -hmm. along with that is um, the federal government, and now everyone hold on to your seats here. Um, they passed legislation um, on Tuesday, actually, unanimously from both houses. Never happened. It's 2018, and the country's in a weird place. But um, they just passed this legislation unanimously, and it's on Trump's desk now, um, and it's the Safe Sport Act of 2017. Um, this is going to require every organization, whether you are a single um, little league with no affiliation to a national governing body, um, all the way up to national governing bodies affiliated with the USOC or an AAU-type organization, Every organization under there is going to be required to do abuse awareness training for everyone. This is um, remarkably life-changing for organizations, and it's going to be, it, it's, it's a positive thing, but getting there is going to be a little bit of a, uh, an Im implementation problem. But uh, also, it was, it, it's a shot to the state that really, you know, the states had an opportunity to solve this problem years ago, and having the federal government come in and manage this process whatever side of the fence you're on in this one, it might be, uh, it's gonna be a little bit difficult initially, just like everything else with safe sport. Um, like we were saying before, is <coughs> all of our coaches uh, yell and scream about initially having to do something, but then once they actually do it, they realize um, that this is a tremendous thing that's being done. So once we get there, but the, the, the safe sport act of 2017 is going to be, it's gonna change the landscape of youth sports across this country. And there's other legislative proposals that are on the table today mm -hmm. that um, senators are going after in regards to abuse. Mm -hmm. And so far as 
they want to make mandated reporters going down as far as a player. Now, whether that will ever happen, I don't know. But one of the other topics is that mandate every NGB to notify their entire membership of any sexual abuse case or case of abuse, that they need to be aware of it, what happened, how it happened, and what was done about it. And that's pretty difficult if for, for USA Hockey to send out to our players, 350,000 kids, you know, about sexual abuse or abuse that has happened. So we're working with the legislative uh, components to try to curtail that to a point where we're willing to notify people, but maybe in a declaration form as to a synopsis as to what has occurred instead of giving the whole dialogue as to the incident. So those are active uh, legislative proposals that are on the table today. Neil, you wanted to add. Yeah, I, I mean, I just wanted to, I mean, it, it's been an interesting discussion. Um, something that strikes me about, uh, and it, thanks, Josh, for taking us out of the closet here as hockey people, but um, what, what's interesting about the sport of hockey, and this isn't about not any other sport either, because this, I think, applies to every sport, but we've got a bit of a microcosm here to make an observation. And what's interesting about hockey is over the years and over the seasons, the game changes. And the changes brought to the game, the game kind of catches up to the social realities. And uh, you know, I, I didn't learn how to fight in the playground. I learned how to fight on a skinny little blade of steel on ice. But you don't fight anymore on ice. And you don't have no touch. You have t touch icing is gone. Now it's no touch icing. And hitting is my five-year-old played rep hockey. He hit at five. My son, six years younger, he didn't learn to hit until, uh, until 12 years of age. So in six years, that game changed dramatically and, and, and continues to change. And, um, and I think, you know, there's hope there, not only for the game of hockey, but also for other sports, particularly contact sports, and like football. Uh, and I'm not telling, a Canadian isn't going to tell an American that the game of football's got to change, but I'll let people in this country figure that one out. <laughs> but it'll change. It's going to have to change. And so when it comes to the social issues around abuse, I mean, this is a societal issue. It's, it's, it's not just locked up in hockey or right. football. It's in the places that we go to make a living. And I think the world is changing, and therefore the sport, and it's going to come down to volunteers, are going to have to figure out a way how to change, not how the game's played, but how the game is observed. And I think things like Josh said and the learning, Josh knows what to look for. Three years from now, the way things go, I'll know what to look for, and people out there will know. Look. So I think it's, it's concerning that we have these issues, but there's a lot of hope, because I can just look at the game of hockey and say, it's changed. As a parent, it's changed. I used to play it. It's changed. I love it. It's changed. And uh, I think football and other heavy contact sports are, are going to go through the same thing, and they, you know, they can be disruptive and transformed. You can Uberize football. You can Uberize. I think it'll be up to the people in the game that love the game that change the game. Make it happen. I like the direction you're taking this. For in the last couple of minutes of this, and most everyone's been here throughout the course of the day. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to give everybody in the panel an opportunity for like a final <coughs> thought as we're as we're about to wrap this whole thing. Can pertain to what we're talking about now, or if you want to speak on something. You saw later, what I don't want you to do is get in the car and say, I was up there, I had this opportunity to say something, and I didn't get a chance to say it. So Josh, if you would. Um, thanks, Tim, appreciate it. And thanks, Tyree and Players Health for having me here. Um, this has been uh, a tremendous opportunity, but the one thing that you can take back on my side is talk to your moms and dads. Um, educate your moms and dads about what their kids are doing. Um, don't just hand your, I, I use the word, hand your keys off um, <coughs> as your children being the keys. Don't just hand them off to a stranger because they tell you that 
um, as Corey was mentioning, uh, that they might be the best baseball player of all time. Don't just trust them blindly. Um, do a little research, ask the questions, um, ask if they're doing alone, it's one-on-one -on -one training, if there's gonna be others there. Um, ask those questions as a parent. Um, don't just be blinded by the promise of scholarship, the promise of uh, major league aspirations, whether it's NFL, NHL, Major League Baseball. Don't be blinded th by those as a parent. As a president of a hockey association, I see this. Um, I tell every one of my first year squirts, first year mites, that no one's gonna get drafted this year. Um, and the parents are still awestruck that their, their kids are not gonna get drafted when they're 10 years old. And I promise you, if that day comes, is that I'll paint my entire body blue. So with that, thanks, I appreciate it. Um, you know, I have a few, uh, few thoughts on everything that happened today, uh, sitting around all day. And um, I come from a sports medicine athletic training background and now have uh, kind of an administrative role with player safety with USA Hockey. And um, so I think on the previous sports medicine panel, Amy was really pushing for athletic training and advocating. And I could sit up here and preach about athletic trainers and being available at sidelines all day long. But I, I think in, earlier in the day, um, someone said youth sports in this country is a multi-billion dollar industry. And my big question I wonder is why is none of that money put towards some of this stuff we were talking about today? We could buy new uniforms every year. We can travel in charter buses. Um, we can pay coaches six figures to coach a youth sport out of the money they're paying. But we don't put money into medical coverage or injury data collection or anything like that. Um, and if there, is, if there is money put towards that, I think it's a very small percentage. Um, so I think, again, it's a culture shift. Um, and I know in hockey, everyone wants those three A's after they're um, playing for such and such hockey club, triple A. I mean, is it so bad if they have one A? Because the second A costs a little bit more and the third A costs even a little bit more than that. Um, and so I, th I think our priorities are a little messed up. Um, and I think some of that money that's going into youth sports should be put towards some of these initiatives towards safety, um, whether it's concussion education or uh, injury data collection. Or, or all of it. Uh, or, yeah, all of it that we've talked about today. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Neil? Uh, that's great. I, I mean, I. And a little bit tongue in cheek. I didn't think I'd come down here and learn that that a, an American could speak Canadian. <laughs> a A and A. I grew up in Buffalo, New York, oh, okay. so we were real close. <laughs> Good A. Uh, for me, it's it's. I, I think a takeaway for me is the word safety and inclusion and partnering in community. And uh, there's there's a lot of issues like. The, the, the abuse issue, the concussion issue, um, insurabilities issues, but I, I think that uh, that mindset and that culture around safety is what's going to drive change and actually get at the data and actually get the parent to speak up or the child to speak up, uh, whether they got a concussion or they felt that something was done untoward to them or to their friend in the change room. So uh, thank you. I think, Tim, I really appreciate your, uh, your questions. Yeah. Steve. Well, first of all, thanks for uh, moderating this and for Players Health for uh, putting this on. It's great. As administrators, and I know there's a lot of administrators out there for uh, every sport you have, um, our sole responsibility is to develop our players and to protect our athletes at all costs. And. Um, under the uh, USOC, you know, there's 47 national governing bodies, and we all have a responsibility to create policy for safe sport and uh, concussion awareness and training for all of our athletes, coaches, players, parents, and volunteers. Um, as a district director for USA Hockey, I was able to take a product from one state and take it to <coughs> several states, including Alaska, Washington, Nevada, Oregon, California. And with me, you know, we brought Jamie on board as the first uh, player safety coordinator concussion 
training person. And she's a volunteer just like we are. And she travels quite extensively and provides training to protect our players and to create concussion awareness to a great deal of our coaches and our parents and our kids and stuff like that. And we've created policies and paperwork that recognizes how to return back to our sport. And after two years, uh, all of these states are now 100% compliant in concussion awareness. So thank you to Jamie for what she's done for our, our sport and sports in general. So I wanted to tack onto something Sally said um, earlier in, in the panel about the shift in, there was a discussion that the shift in uh, youth sports, maybe that the numbers are declining, not increasing, but then you brought up that other sports are increasing in numbers that we don't maybe always think about as sports. So I would just like to say that regardless of the sport, even if it's frisbee golf, <laughs> whatever it may be that, that you used as an example, um, and you asked about who's responsible and who's accountable. The administrators of those programs are, and so uh, for me, my focus is making that culture shift. What is your culture? So I challenge you to look within your organizations and just ask yourself if you're doing it right. If you can identify your biggest risk in your organization or in your sport, ask yourself if you are doing the top one, two, or three things to try to mitigate that risk or address it head on. You know, Are you putting programs in place that allow you to create open dialogue with your membership about that risk. You know, are, are you doing it right? I guess that's probably my uh, parting thoughts would be, you know, just to, to challenge you to really look inward and make sure that you're creating a culture that allows your membership and your sport to thrive. And I just want to point out too that this was described as the most Minnesota panel ever with a definite West Coast flavor. Yeah. Because <laughs> I, I was walking in behind Jamie and Steve today and I was cussing how cold it was. They weren't wearing <laughs> overcoats, and they're from California, and Jamie was saying how great this was. Uh, so that's, right. that's an optimist right there. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming and attending today, and, and you for giving up your time and dispensing your information, and for Tyree for allowing me to be a part of this, uh, this opportunity today. When he talked about this about nine months ago when we first talked about this, he just had a vision. And to see this come forward, and to see people give up their time and their day, and to take something away from this and go make this whole uh, culture of sports better, especially for children, is a wonderful thing, and I thank you. Thank you.